Good morning, everyone. My name is Monica Medina. I'm so glad to see this full house for an incredible conversation about sustainable agriculture and climate smart agriculture. This is, I think, the cutting edge of where the climate movement is going and where it needs to go. So let me briefly say a word about myself and about these wonderful panelists. I'm the former Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, Environment, and Science, and uh, got to do a lot of interesting work all around the world trying to promote better agricultural practices. But these folks are the real experts, and we are very lucky to have them today. We have with us um, Under Secretary, uh, the Honorable Dr. Shavonda uh, Jones Young, if I got this right. <laughs> Jacobs Young, Jacobs Young, so sorry, Jacobs Young, Brad Ringeisen with um, in the Innovative Genomics Institute, and Jennifer Bushman, who is an expert on sustainable seafood and uh, has started an incredible nonprofit called Fed by Blue and is uh, an executive producer of a film, and she'll tell us more about that in a minute. Dr. Um, uh, Jacobs Young is the head of the Agriculture Department's um, efforts on innovation, research, education, and economics, which is a huge portfolio. She's also the chief scientist of the organization, the whole of the United uh, States Department of Agriculture. That's an enormous job. I'm sure she's going to tell us much more about that. And Brad um, runs this wonderful cutting-edge genomics institute that is working on new ways of growing things in a much more sustainable way, but he has an incredible past and we owe him a debt of gratitude because in his previous life, he was at the Defense Department working on COVID therapies and vaccines. So thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jennifer, for what you're doing. And thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Jacobs Young, sorry, it's, it's can I say Shavonda, <laughs> Brad and Jennifer, um, for, uh, for all the work that you do. Um, this is going to be an incredible panel where we think about how to change the most fundamental thing to everyone on the planet, which is food. Food represents 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions that are currently um, happening around the world. That's an enormous amount. And 20% of it alone is in the agriculture sector. So we have a huge hill ahead of us. Um, we know that climate is stressing farmers all over the world in ways that they haven't experienced in the past, from floods to droughts to higher risks um, of uh, and less predictability in what they've done for you know millennia. It's it's changing so fast that farmers are having a hard time coming to grips with these enormous enormous changes. And at the same time, we see a global food marketplace that has competition from all around the world, but is also stressed by supply chains that don't work as well as they should somewhat because of climate change. Again, and prices are high, and there's a lot of food insecurity all around the world. So we know this is an enormous challenge between the greenhouse gas emissions, the logistical challenges of feeding the world, and the 8 billion people who really need healthy, sustainable food. We know we have an enormous challenge, but we also have tremendous potential. Um, we have potential in the blue, which Jennifer will tell us more about, and all kinds of new sustainable agricultural practices that can revolutionize the way that we even think about how to grow food and store carbon and make the soil in all over the world, much more healthy and sustainable for the long term, for future generations. So it's not just feeding us today and the 8 billion people today, but feeding all of our future generations. So this is going to be, I hope, an incredibly interesting discussion and a really thought-provoking one because, again, it comes down to something that is basic for human life, which is food. So with that, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to kick off with a couple of with a couple of minutes of remarks, and then we'll dive into questions. So first to you, Undersecretary. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shavonda jacob Young, and I'm so happy to be with you here this week. Uh, I have been with the Department of Agriculture for a little over two decades, and um, uh, previous to that, a career at the University of Washington as a professor. I promise to not ask you any questions today. 
based on what I've said. There will be no test. Um, so I've been very fortunate to be in science for agriculture for those two decades, um, joining um, with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture as a young federal professional, and then ultimately becoming head of that agency for a year, um, heading the Agriculture Research Service for eight years, and uh, the Office of the Chief Scientist, the White House for two years as a senior advisor for agriculture, and now having the honor of being the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics in USDA's Chief Scientist. Thank you so much, appreciate that. So under, under my leadership um, as undersecretary, we're the science mission area for USDA. Uh, so I have a wonderful job. We, we cut across everything that we do in the Department of Agriculture, which is a science-based organization. Uh, we have the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is our extramural funding arm. Uh, we fund in, in partnership with the land-grant universities. We fund innovative ideas no matter where they come from. If you're an individual in your garage or you're at a high-powered organization, if you have an innovative scientific idea, you can write a proposal to NIFA and uh, we will consider it for funding. Very excited about a lot of the work that NIFA has played in the last three years under the three major pieces of legislation, including the Inflation Reduction Act and the American Rescue Plan. Um, also, uh, Agriculture Research Service is our extramural, our intramural research agency. Um, and as most previously head of that agency, we have a thousands, about 2,000 PhD scientists, about 6,000, 6,500 other employees in 95 locations across the country. And we're working on everything from A to Z that has to do with agriculture. Um, one of the things I love about USDA Ag is we don't do science for science sake. It has to be applicable and translatable into something that matters for producers and for consumers. And so it was just the delight of my life to be head of that agency. Um, the National Agriculture Statistics Service conducts what we call the Census of Agriculture. And I'm not sure how many farmers we have in the room. Oh, thank you. They, oh, okay. Hopefully you all turned in your surveys <laughs> for the Census of Agriculture, which we conduct every five years and most recently, uh, we, we, we reported on the results of that 2022 Census of Ag. And what we learned, and unfortunately, is that we're continuing to lose farms across the United States of America. We've, we've lost over 500,000 um, 500, farms. Wow. Um, we have lost more land in agriculture. And um, interestingly, we're seeing the age of our producers continue to increase. Now, the older I get, that doesn't sound that alarming, but <laughs> it is alarming because our average farmer is over the age of 58. Just think about that. And a large portion of them are over the age of 65. And so we have imperatives in agriculture. And at the same time, we have a lot of farms that are not being profitable. And so how do you encourage folks to stay in farming so that we can be in this lovely room dressed in our lovely clothes and not have to worry about where our food comes from? Well, climate change offers us an amazing opportunity to come together, to coalesce around goals and, and, and what we want to accomplish with climate. We have an opportunity to really research how climate change is impacting agriculture, and at the same time, partner with our biggest partners, the farmers across this country, to help them be able to respond to climate change, to be able to create economic opportunities. I'm glad that Jennifer is here and we're going to hear about some more of these innovations because the truth is most farms don't make money. And I don't know about, especially the young people in the room, how we encourage you to go do something where we're going to tell you you may have to work a second job to make money. And so part of our USDA posture and our policies are around working with those small and mid-sized farms across the country. And climate change provides an amazing opportunity for us to use policy, not just policy, but also dollars, to help those small and mid-sized farmers to be able to increase the number of revenue streams they have, be able to adapt and adopt and implement climate smart production practices, lower the, the, uh, uh, the cost of their inputs, be a part of the energy revolution, to not generate just enough energy for their farms, but also to, to send back to the grid, another income opportunity. So I just want to share with you that um, I'm happy to be as a part of this conversation. We cannot solve our climate problems and our climate challenges without agriculture being at the table. Uh, they, oh, yeah, I have a choir here, right? You know, and thank you for choosing this session to be in. Our world population is going to exceed 9 billion people by 2050, and all of those people will need to eat. And we, at the same time, we need to be able to protect our environment. Agriculture productivity has grown by 142% in this country. 
think about that, 142%, no increases in land and no increases in labor, science, innovation are the only way to see our way to the future. Thank you, Shavonda. That's very inspiring. <laughs> Round of applause. All right, Brad, tell us more about what you do. Yeah, well, it's perfect because uh, we are the innovators. Um, and so uh, my last job uh, before I got to the IGI was actually at a place called DARPA. Um, and it's basically a, a place where you learn how to take big bets and big swings on, on sort of really, really uh, you know, innovative ideas. Um, but it's the Department of Defense, it's DOD. Um, and so after working for several years there, I really came to the conclusion that I wanted to try to follow some of my passions in this space, in, in the climate space. And I feel really compelled to, to, try to, to try to do that and sort of bring some of the DARPA mentality into this world. So uh, back in 2020, uh, I saw a job posting and a job opening at a place on the, on the campus of UC Berkeley, um, which happens to be the home of a person named Jennifer Doudna um, of CRISPR-Cas uh, you know, fame, gene editing fame. And this is Jennifer's uh, institute. It's the, it's the Innovative Genomics Institute, the IGI. And when I interviewed for the job, I told Jennifer that if we were only going to be doing biomedical research, if we're only going to be developing CRISPR cures, that it wasn't the right job. That I'm happy to, to shepherd that. I'm happy to work with that. But there's this space of agriculture, of climate that is underfunded. It, it, it's lacking some of these ideas. It's lacking some of the innovation. So CRISPR can be that answer there as well. So yes. CRISPR is going to revolutionize biomedical world. There's the first cure uh, was actually approved by the FDA for sickle cell. It's amazing. It's phenomenal. It's fantastic. But in reality, if you think about this, the success of what CRISPR can do in the medical space, maybe you affect thousands of people. Maybe if, if things work out beautifully, you're affecting millions of people. That's a win. Millions of new lives that might, might be saved. But if you succeed in the space of agriculture and climate, you're literally affecting billions of people. It's a factor of a thousand more. And so that's what I'm here to talk about today is just the amazing potential that CRISPR has to be able to create climate resilient crops, to be able to reduce some of those emissions um, that, that are really difficult to mitigate emissions. We're, we're not talking about CO2 here. We're talking about methane, nitrous oxide, fertilizer use, which is one of the reasons that we've seen such a, a huge improvement and gain uh, of, of productivity and efficiency in, in, in crops. Um, but it's also not very good for the climate and for the environment. And at the same time, the IGI has a really big effort in carbon capture and carbon dioxide removal. And that comes with the co-benefit of potentially making soils more fertile and more organic rich. Um, and I think that there's, we have to emphasize the co-benefits. Yes, there's economic opportunities, increase yields, let's make more money. And we look a lot at uh, the, the global south. Let's, let's allow some of those subsistence farmers to be able to actually become income farmers and help raise their families and their communities. But a lot of that starts with soil. And so we look a lot at soil. Uh, if you come ask me about the microbiome, I will talk to you way, way, way too much about the soil microbiome. But there is an opportunity also to use CRISPR on those organisms and to be able to actually enhance the way that crops interact with the soil, to be able to put some, some uh, more fertility and more organics back into the soil. So those are some of the things I'm really excited about in terms of the innovation, but uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to Love it. And, you know, uh, co-benefits, yes. Thank you for innovating. Co-benefits is a great way to say wins, triple wins. One technology gets you so many benefits. It's really amazing, and I can't wait to hear more. But we need to now let Jen talk about her work in the blue part of our agricultural sector. Jen. And we're not talking about blueberries. <laughs> Blue foods, by definition, are foods from both freshwater and marine. So understand that while we often have a conversation about commercial fishermen and the egregious practices, and that only adds up to 2% of the entire protein that we eat on the planet. So we have to talk also about the hundreds of millions of people that get fed from fresh water as well. And it's those algaes and seaweeds and kelps and, and seafood, bivalves and fish and seafood, shellfish that all can combine to create this blue food system. To give you an idea, the planet is 71% water. 
And I can also explain to you, and you can probably realize the fact that we won't be able to feed 10 billion if we don't think about the way in which we utilize that water to merge protection with production in service to our food system. And we're already doing it. Over 3.2 billion people on the planet rely on foods from water, some part of their nutrients, every day. In essence, since the beginning of time, our waters have acted as the largest food bank in the world. And that's because if you live anywhere near a lake or a pond or a stream or the ocean and you're hungry, you can still go out and fish for your dinner. So the mission of my organization, Fed by Blue, is to get you thinking about that because most of these food conversations tend to be very land focused. Now, the United States is also at an enormous food deficit when it comes to production of fish and seafood. While we manage our wild capture fisheries very well and we can continue to do better there, we also have to think about aquaculture. There are farmers in landlocked areas all across the United States that are starting to convert a portion of their production to things like farming tilapia and shrimp and salmon in order to be able to have another income stream to go into grocery stores at a higher margin level. But it also help, will help us fight nutritional injustice in the United States because the minute we produce more fish and seafood, this is the lowest carbon footprint and the most nutritious food on the planet. And the minute we produce more in the United States and lower transportation costs and stop importing as much as we do, because almost 70% of fish and seafood is imported, then all of a sudden we can have access into vulnerable communities. We can build out economies. So part of our work is to build an impact campaign so that if some of these facts were surprising to you, maybe they won't be in the future. And that we look at this mostly blue planet as a way in where, which we have to merge how we nourish ourselves on land and see. And as part of that, I'm really proud to give you a little sneak peek of a docu-series that is um, executive produced by David E. Kelly, L.A. Law, Ally McBeal, Boston Legal Fame. He also happens to be the largest trout farmer in the United States because out of the state of Idaho, he believes in the power of the water farmer to be able to contribute to food systems. Executive produced by Andrew Zimmerman and starring Martha Stewart, Jose Andres, and a number of others, including Shailene Woodley. This will start to air on June 19th on PBS all across the country and will be in 90% of schools by August. You'll walk into the grocery store and you're going to see activations or maybe a restaurant near you to learn about responsible seafood and how again to align water protection with water production. So I give you a little sneak peek of what we're calling Hope in the Water, airing on June 19th, um, a docu-series from David E. Kelly and Andrew Zimmerman. It feels like a contradiction. We must save our oceans. And we must also feed ourselves. But there are people all over the world trying to do both. I had no idea that urchin diver was a job. Smile. We can't really separate protecting the environment from human society. We're part of it. I'm no environmentalist. I'm just from the community. You know, who in their right mind would raise saltwater shrimp in the state of Minnesota? so many other places like this they're waiting for us to like wake them up but in order for you to keep enjoying the riches of the ocean you're gonna have to also be a friend of the ocean what we're hoping is that we'll be able to help indigenous peoples change their relationship with the sea Sustainability is to sustain, you know, to extend life, not just of the fish or the natural resource, but of us. Sometimes I think we should burn it all down, right? But this is what we've got and we can make it ours. Wow, I get goosebumps looking at, at something like that because there is so much hope out there, I think. And 
I used to work at NOAA, the agency in the federal government that worked on oceans, and my boss there was Jane Lubchenco, who now works in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, and she used to say, we need to have a mutiny for the bounty, and that is exactly what I think that your, sh your show will tell us more about. So. All right, well, let's get started um, with some questions. And um, I will come to the audience, I promise. <laughs> In fact, we'll try and save a lot of time for audience Q&A, because I'm sure your questions are better than the ones I could think of. But let me toss to each of the panelists to just get us even more excited about the potential of this. Tell us each one thing that you're looking at that's sort of really out there on the horizon that could revolutionize the way we think about food and climate. Dr. Uh, Shavanda, sorry, Dr. Shavanda. Yes, I don't want to yeah. leave out your science cred That's, because listen, it's so. Listen, it's okay. Important. One of the things we learn once you got it, they can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a. It's, so it's not an innovation that I'm excited about. Although I'm excited about a lot of innovations, and I'm trusting that these my two panel colleagues are going to going to cover that. I'm excited about a new paradigm shift. I'm excited that President, President Biden and Secretary Vilsack have tasked us with reimagining the American farm. Going beyond mere subsistence for some farmers, uh, moving beyond just agriculture production, but being entrepreneurial enterprises. And at the same time, being our partners and meeting our climate goals. The pandemic elucidated some real challenges we have in our food system in, in the United States. We recognized how vulnerable we are when, uh, when we are consolidated, when we have meat processing consolidated, when we have transportation systems that um, just need one incident and we have a problem. And so we've been very busy across this country working with small to mid-sized farmers because we recognize that we have a lot of room for our large farmers because there's, we don't want to get rid of big farms. We need big farms. But we also need small and mid-sized farms to succeed. We need people to stay in rural communities that matter. A large portion of our military come from rural communities. What happens when everybody leaves rural communities? The schools can't thrive. The hospitals can't thrive. People can't have a business that works. And that all generates around the farm and the viability of the farm. So how do we help those farmers make money? How do we find those income streams? How do we help them create local and regional markets? If I'm growing shrimp in Minnesota, how do I get that to my local school? Do states and cities have the storage facilities? Do they have the refrigerators that need to happen? How do we diversify meat processing across the country? Creating those local and regional food systems. How do we help farmers diversify what they grow like we diversify our stocks? How do we help them be successful? How do we help veterans return to the farm and be successful? How do we help people who have a disability be successful on the farm? And so the paradigm around creating an entrepreneurial enterprise that is environmentally friendly, that is sustainable, that is resilient, that helps us and we help them in partnership, how do we make that happen? And that's where I'm excited about the investments that we've seen, historic investments in climate action. The Inflation Reduction Act, just, so DARPA, I'm so jealous of DARPA. I can't tell you this. I, I was almost, I couldn't sit next to this guy. <laughs> because the amount of money that has gone into innovation in certain spaces has, agriculture has not seen that type of investment. And so we were so excited that the Inflation Reduction Act included agriculture as a significant part of the investment around clean energy, around climate smart agricultural practices. It really said, agriculture, you're important here, and you're so important, we're going to give you funding. So we have one program that's $3.1 billion that we have invested in 141 projects across this country, reducing what we heard from farmers, the risk of adopting these practices. How do we get out there and help farmers transition to some of these practices and be successful? How can we help him or her stand out in their field and have an, a mobile phone and have the data they need to make intelligent decisions about treating? Because we know that more fertilizer, more fertilizer, more fertilizer is not the answer. We know that the crops and animals that we breed with, you know, looking at advanced technologies, we have to talk about um, empowering regulatory environments, but we won't, that's not the topic of this discussion today. 
But as we're innovating in the laboratories, how do we create success for those being pushed out and used by the people who need them? I'm going to stop there because I know that uh, we're going to hear a lot. We're going to have a chance to talk with a lot of people. But reimagining the American farm is the innovation of this time for us. Wow, that's great. great. So yeah. first thing, first big innovation is government investment in climate smart, in agricultural um, adaptation. Adaptation. All right, Brad. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, there's so much that I could talk about. I'm going to go to one. I'm only I'm going to stick to one. Come to my uh, spark talk tomorrow. I'll yes. give you more innovations and more possibilities tomorrow morning. Um, but I've got a big one that I want to talk about today. Um, a few years ago, the IGI invested in a professor at UC Davis, one of the best uh, agriculture schools in the, in the country. It's just about an hour down the road from UC Berkeley. Um, and his name's Dr. Sun Sundarson. So it goes by Sundar. So Sundar's dream was to create a seed that had the same traits as the seed that you put in the ground. Okay, so you put a seed in the ground, your crop grows. If you harvest those seeds, we're talking about next generation hybrids. This is part of the reason that we have such high yields, at least especially here in this country, these hybrid seed productions. If you take a seed that's growing from a hybrid seed, its traits are across the board. That you do not get the same level of yields. There's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity that goes into that, that, that goes into the seeds that are grown by those. So farmers basically don't grow those seeds. They don't, they, they, they either toss them out or they just, you know, don't, don't go there. They go back to the supplier, they buy the seed again the next year, they put them in the ground. Okay? So Sundar's dream was to essentially come up with what he calls a clonal seed. There's something called apomixis, which is essentially asexual reproduction. It would allow this, the plant to produce clones of itself each and every year, generation to generation to generation. He's succeeded in doing this. He's actually published it a couple years ago where he's actually taken rice, a, a hybrid rice plant, and for I think up to five generations was able to get a clonal seed production so that the farmer could now become empowered, take those seeds, put them in the ground the next year, not have to buy them ag again next year, and be able to produce the same yields that they had the year before. So let's put that in the context. The United States could be revolutionary for the United States, but a lot of what we think about at the IGI is, is sort of the, the world and, and sort of the low middle income farmer. Think about the empowerment that would occur if one of those farmers could take their local variety, and we work with farmers and uh, uh, scientists in, in places like Africa. We actually have an Africa CRISPR course that we fund to be able to train some scientists so they can work on local varieties uh, that they use in, 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 in the farms, the local communities that they have. Be able to take those seeds, let that farmer now have higher yields. You know, a lot of the seed technology that they use are 20, 30 years old. If they can now take hybrid seed productions and now har harvest those seeds and plant them in the ground uh, again without having essentially at zero cost to themselves. It would be you know, empowering to those lo low and middle income farmers. So that's one example of what technology I think could do in the sort of the future of farming that we're really excited about. Wow, seeds coming right down to like the very core of it all, seeds and um, that ability of farmers everywhere to regenerate their local food sources. And that's so important to culture on top of uh, yeah, everything else. That's one of those things that we talk about all the time, that it can't be the West or the global North sort of saying, oh, here, take these technologies. It has to be co-developed with, uh, with, with localities and local communities. That's something that, that we uh, are, are very, very insistent on as a nonprofit public school at UC, UC California, I mean, University of California. Wonderful. Jen. So imagine Yellowstone National Park of the sea. Because right now, less than 1% of all of our ocean is protected. And guess what happens when you have a Yellowstone National Park of the ocean? President Bush, expanded by President Obama, created the largest marine protected area in the state of Hawaii. And three years ago, the science came back on that and while all of the fishermen were all up in arms about the fact that they couldn't fish in this particular area, which is the size of the state of Texas, the tuna fishery rebounded, and there's more tuna there now outside of the area of the MPA than has been since King Kamehameha's time. 
it's again the alignment of water protection with water production we have the chumash tribe now that has actually now put in an application and it will be passed in some way shape or form for a marine protected area that is off of the coast of california those fish don't know that there is um, a limit the, where the MPA is versus where they swim out to go and then come back. But when you give it places to spawn, when you give corals a place to regenerate, when you give marine mammals a place to be able to be protected, all of a sudden the waters rebound. And what ends up happening is they're more productive to our food system. So what I'm excited about for you in the future is to not only recognize that this blue food system will be a contributive part of not just the fact that everybody's eating it anyway, by the way, but that you will be thinking about it as you build the plate of the future, but it's that we will then have thriving coastal communities, indigenous communities, fishermen now that are not losing their, um, like in places where they're starting to lose these working waterfronts. And all of a sudden it starts to look like the shape of what we want. So what I'm excited about is for us all to really be able to get on board, be part of dialogues like this so that we encourage fish and seafood eating. Part of our PBS Learning Media program is to get a kid to eat seaweed. We will farm more seaweed in the United States by 2040 than we do potatoes. And it's not just going to be on your sushi roll. It's going to be in all different aspects from your tomato sauce for the umami to the nutritional value that it brings into your salads. Teach the next generation how to eat these foods because they are the food of the future. Wow, that's wonderful. And speaks to me in my NOAA days, having helped work on those marine protected areas. And there are folks in the audience here who've done the same. So um, that's incredibly inspiring. Jen, I want to go back to you and ask you the hard question, which is tell us about how we protect the marine environment in a, you know, a situation where we start to farm in the blue. Um, because I think people are worried about that. That's been the thing that's held us back for decades. So well, I think, first of all, whenever I talk to you about aquaculture, raise of hands, do you think of salmon? And then you immediately say, friends don't let friends eat farmed fish, <laughs> right? Um, this is the first time since the 1970s when we all get to participate in what that farming looks like. Yes, there have been bad practices. Most of them have been outside the United States. We haven't really created a strong um, legislatory framework, a policy framework to be able to get those um, farms into the water. So you get to participate in that. You know, do you want them antibiotic free? Do you want there to be um, more sustainable feed systems? Everybody talks about what do you feed fin fish? Are they systems where you have oysters and bivalves and seaweed and fin fish? Multitropic systems. So there are there there is more data technology now in aqua tech than there is in farming. And folks like Google and Tidal X are able to actually raise the fish down to the individual in an open ocean net pin system. So what I would say to this is just like you can farm a chicken well and you can farm a chicken badly, you're looking for the farmer you want to support where you can make your dollars, really take your dollars and meet your values. The same is true for the water farmer. And we are way behind in the way in which we're thinking about this. And part of socializing a new food system is building trust. And you have to believe and trust that we're going to know what to do in the future. So what I would say is that it's all there in front of us. Your old narrative, your old vision of the water farmer is, is antiquated. There's a bill in front of Congress now that EDF has put in front of both, par uh, both parties have actually um, underwritten this bill that's going to allow us to start to look at opportunity zones to raise fish in U.S. waters across our coastal areas. Get on board it, get educated, don't have it be just a friends, don't let friends eat farmed seafood. Find the farmer you love and support them fiercely, whether you're nourishing yourself on land or by sea. Wonderful. So Brad, let me um, stick with this water theme. Um, because you didn't talk about it too much yet, but water is one of the really big challenges, either too much or too little. So talk about the next generation of seeds and why um, you think they can resist kind of what's to come. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the big things that we're trying to work on at the IGI is just climate resiliency um, or adaptation. Um, this, this is something that is going to happen, right? I mean, clearly, we are not living in our parents' climate, and our kids are probably not going to live in our climate. Um, so, so we have a feeling of what's going to be happening in the future. So it's going to be more droughts. It's going to be more floods. Um, and I think CRISPR can help. I think it's something that is a very, very precise tool. Um, and we haven't really talked about like sort of GMOs, uh, at least in the United States, anything, most things that are uh, gene edited uh, with CRISPR are in terms of crops are not considered GMOs. It's a very precise tool. You're, you know, most of the things in the edits that you would make could be found naturally uh, in, in nature. And so uh, a lot of times they're not considered uh, GMOs. Um, but with respect to water specifically, um, especially now living out in California, we know how precious water is. <laughs> Um, and I think there's things that you can do. Uh, there are things that we're currently doing right now. We're, we're creating uh, a, 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 a seed of rice that actually produces fewer pores. They're called stomatas. Um, it's, it's what the plant uses to be able to essentially do gas exchange. Um, but that's also where water escapes the leaves. Um, so if you make fewer stomata, uh, you lose less water, and you don't have to put in as much water um, to be able to, to make it sort of a, 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 a you know, a, a, something that can be grown on less irrigation and less water. That's actually being field tested at, at, a, at an international site in Cali, Colombia right now um, because it works so well in California, and we're, and we're going to try to do that international, international field trial. Um, but there's also uh, ways to be able to create deeper roots. Um, and if you can make a crop with a deeper root, then you probably it will be it will be more drought tolerant. Uh, and there's also the advantage. Then again, you can see my my co-benefits are are sort of the uh, the theme for me. Uh, if you make something that's deeper root, gets to more water, but at the same time, about 20 20 percent or more of the carbon that escapes the plant actually goes in and and gets secreted out of the roots. They're called exudates. And if you can get those d roots deeper, then the exudates have a much higher probability of staying put in the soil because deeper carbon uh, usually stays put for longer. There's just less microbial activity the deeper you go into soil. So there can be, again, there can be co-benefits. Use CRISPR, try to, you know, we're in the process of doing this now with our partners at, at Berkeley and UC Davis to try to get those roots to be, to be, to be denser and deeper um, to be able to push more of that carbon down, but also draw more, draw more water up. Wow, so very cool and so different from the way I think people have thought about genetically modified agricultural products up until now. So let me continue with the nature theme because regeneration is really such an important part of it and, and we ha of agriculture in general and, and we haven't used um, the benefits of ag to sort of uh, our, benef our advantage. Talk about cover crops and some of the things that are being encouraged with these new government programs and this new funding that is transformative. Yeah, so just want to touch on a couple of points that have been made thus far. You know, in, in the Agriculture Research Service, we have been doing a lot of uh, research around being prepared for when we have the opportunity to move our, our blue farms forward, right? Yes. So we're doing the catfish research, we're doing the trout research, we're looking at the shellfish and the management systems, disease management, all flavoring catfish, which I didn't even know was a thing, but it's an, it is a thing. So that when we are farming, we know that we're gonna be producing a product that people wanna eat. Um, USDA also delivers the dietary guidelines. We have six nutrition research centers in ARS, and we deliver 16 feeding programs across the country from women, infant, and children, a breakfast and lunch program for 30 million children a day, um, looking at our food stamps, our SNAP program, all of those programs, and they're based with under science undergirds all of them. So we're doing a lot of research. And part of those guidelines tell us we want to have more seafood. And we recognize, I think when I was at OSTP a long time ago, I think it was up to 90% of our seafood was being imported. And so our this is a wonderful opportunity for, for our country, for our diets, for our, our farmers, for the economic opportunities, for, for all of us. I don't think we can lose if we have an opportunity to move that forward. Um, and then in terms of plant and varieties de de development, um, I always talk to young people about going into the store, they never know what it's like to wait for something to be in season. So I'm just old enough to know you had when you had to wait. I see some heads shaking, so you know this. Uh, we have such a global environment now. We have a global ag enterprise now. Um, and we also have scientists who are fast at work every day developing varieties that can be withhold extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme drought, extreme flooding, you know? And so we're 
always, 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 CRISPR-Cas9 is an advance tool that's going to uh, enable us to move forward fast. And we have to still re rely on classical breeding because Americans have not necessarily you know, jumped on the bandwagon for you know, some of these technologies. But it was not, we shouldn't stop trying because we, sh we need to be prepared when the time comes. But what we're doing in, in ARS and the USDA is using our germplasm collection, uh, recognizing that maize, soybeans, we've had a lot of investments in that space mm -hmm. um, from the, the, the philanthropists, from private industry. We're taking a lot of that technology, that advanced technology, and we're using it for specialty crops and animals. Mm -hmm. So trout looking at things like sweet potatoes, alfalfa. And so um, alfalfa was one of the organizations that we wanted to work on. Um, and they had a three-year window to get a new variety, three years. So using these advanced technologies, we've been able to lower that to nine months or less. But once again, raising the awareness of the opportunities that are missed, the potentials that are missed if we don't change the paradigm. And so that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful success story where we're making headway in those spaces. And so Americans can really enjoy what we love to have every day, make sure it's nutritious. We're spoiled in this country. Our food is actually reasonably priced. And I know we complain a lot about things. Every time Thank something changes, we that. complain. But if you travel overseas, you talk about our overseas, uh, our international, um, the members of our globe, who spend an enormous portion of their discretionary budget on food. And so I don't remember what the original question was, Monica. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, You're you were, you, um, algae, which now there are thriving algae farms that are now, did you see Ben and Jerry's ice cream that just came out that's blue? And it's coming from a natural algae farm from California. And all of that innovation sat right here. So the natural colors that you've been demanding, as well as feed components to be able to bring omega, greater omega-3s to fish and seafood, all in the feed components, came from this innovation. Um, and so that's, I mean, we couldn't be where we are without it. It's amazing, and really, um, it, it speaks to the power of nature and finding these systems that make nature work better for us. Instead of fighting nature and defeating nature and using it up, we're actually thinking about how to harness it for our own benefit, which is tremendous and gives me a lot of hope. Let me ask one last question of everybody, and then I will turn it over to the audience. And this is an important one. It, it, it gets to the question of diversity and equity and inclusion and justice when it comes to food systems. I wondered if you could each give me a little bit of a perspective on this from where you sit in the agricultural sector. Um, uh, Shavanda, let's start with you. Definitely. Um, this has been an, an, an exciting time for me, being undersecretary um, at, the, at this time, where we've made equity a core of everything we do at USDA. Um, so, some will, we acknowledge that we don't have the best history when it comes to being equitable. And so I've been very happy to be a part of the leadership to be able to move us in that direction. I think about our Justice 40 initiative that talks about 40% of overall benefits of federal climate, clean energy, and all of our, our climate investments have to go to disadvantaged communities, marginalized by underinvestment and overburdened by pollution. So that came from the president himself. Mm -hmm. And so everything we from do- From day one. From day one has an equity focus. Um, I think about the beauty of this, being able to replicate seeds for our indigenous community that we're working with. Talk about building trust, because now we have to get the communities to come back to work with us, and we've been working hard at that. And the indigenous community has so much knowledge about agronomic practices that you know can help us. We have things that can help co-benefits. We have information that can help them, and they have a lot of inf information and traditional knowledge that can help us. And one of those things is how do we preserve the plants and animals that are so critical to that community? And so um, I'm really excited about our equity um, efforts and the fact that it's been an incremental part of everything we're doing. Brad. 
Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly address this. You know, we, we're a nonprofit. I've already talked about the fact that we're part of the University of California system. And, um, but we're philanthropically driven. Like 80, 90% of what we do is, is philanthropy. And I'll, I'll give a lot of credit to some of our philanthropic sponsors that talk a lot about DEI. And, it, and you know, they, they ask us these questions. And, and it's, it's about not just our staff. It's, talk, it's about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to bring into the world. And I've talked a little bit about already in terms of sort of communities and working directly with local communities. So a lot of it for us is partnerships. And you know, I, I mentioned a partnership with SEAT. Uh, it's a it's a part of the CGIAR network of of laboratories, and uh, one of them is SEATs uh, in in Colombia. We work directly with their scientists, and we 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 do those field trials internationally. Um, we do uh, send our scientists all over the globe. We actually sent uh, two of our graduate students to go train. Uh, regulators in the Philippines <laughs> to, because they wanted to know more about CRISPR and try to understand because they want to get a heads up of what's coming through the pipeline in the, in, the, in the coming decades. So it's all about partnerships. We're signing an MOU with one of the biggest research organizations in uh, agriculture in, in, in India. Um, so for us, it's getting out into the world. If we're just in our laboratories in Berkeley, California, we are not doing our job. And it's the philanthropists that are, that are requiring this, but at the same time, it's the mission uh, from myself and from Jennifer Doudna that this is part of what we do. And then the last thing I'll say in my business, in the scientific business, and I think farmers agree with this as well, it's about data. <laughs> yeah. You have to show and see with your own eyes that something works. You can't just trust a scientist in a laboratory that it works. You have to see data. So if you're going to see those uh, apomictic seeds, you, the farmer's going to want to see from generation to generation that you actually get similar yields, and they want to see that with their own eyes. We've seen this in uh, S Southeast Asia and Southern Asia, in Bangladesh, with flood-tolerant rice. We see pictures of farmers growing the flood-tolerant rice, and they see their variety struggling, and the, and the, the flood-tolerant rice working. And so if you can see it with your eyes and you can show data, that's what those partnerships ultimately will do. And, and their neighbor farmers are watching. That's right. Yes, that's right. And that's who they word trust. of mouth spreads quick. <laughs> and so that's I think who they trust. That sub one version of rice, I think, I think it's grown by six or seven million farmers in South Asia now. It, it's, it's word of mouth. Wow. So fish and seafood has a problem because uh, it, it, is a, it is a white man's world that is aging pretty quickly. And um, and it, it really honestly has a long way to go. And that is why we have to be very intentional as we build out this system. Um, the Seafood Act, for example, very specifically has DEI already written into the act. So there has to be, and, and I, mean, I mean, we have to have certain percentages. They have to come from certain communities. We want to make sure that we're building an equitable um, employment base if we're going to build this out as for the pleasure, the honor of farming food, seafood in our waters or to be growing um, seafood in our waters. We need to sit at the table and say, this is part of the urgently needed DEI has to be baked into this. For Fed by Blue, we chose PBS as a partner for a lot of reasons. You can imagine Apple, Netflix, everybody wanted to be a part of a first ever unscripted David E. Kelly series. Whoever thought selling a series would be hard, I, you know, it's my first, I had no idea. And it was like, well, everybody wants to meet with me. This is amazing. But actually, we very specifically picked PBS because of its first and foremost standards, procedures, and practices audits. There is no industry money in what we do. We have private individuals and foundations because they have not only invested in ocean, but they believe in an equitable blue food system. We had to be trained under the DEI policies of PBS. And then what we decided was everything we were learning here, we were applying to our NGO. Every single thing, no industry money, no one who's going to benefit from the increase of blue food consumption. How do we do this in a way that is equitable? How do we give honor to these indigenous communities when we were talking about in Sitka, Alaska, where you heard about the billion snow crab that just disappeared, one of the largest harvests that was supposed to happen, and all of a sudden, where'd they go? Well, 
the temperatures rose in the area, their appetites didn't go down because that's what happens when there's cold water and they cannibalized one another. But the, but the unintended benefits of that, unfortunately, was that those indigenous communities were not working in the processing plants. They weren't able to get the harvest to feed their own communities. How are we being, how are we looking at what past learnings, ancient wisdom is going to apply to what we want to see in the future? And that's not easy when you also have have, again, this tradition. But now, and you'll see it in the series, there's a group that's growing kelp. And what they're doing is they're learning different ways in which to process it. They're learning about different ways to be able to bring that nutrition and the, that eating to their community, but also create an economy from it. So this is going to look a little different than the salmon that they used to go out and fish for. But it doesn't mean that we can't apply all of that as we look down the road and around the bend. And the best stewards of that, in my opinion, are those women seaweed farmers, of which of all the seaweed uh, that's farmed in the world, 70% women farmers. Because the men fished out their fishery, and now the women aren't going to let the kids starve. So listen to me. <laughs> We're going to get this thing done one way or another, and it's going to include Sorry. food from water. <laughs> yes, indeed. I will never forget being at a big event, a climate event, trying to show the need for investment um, from climate funds. And a woman from an African country raised her hand and said, there is no better investment than a woman fisher. And the whole room just sort of stopped. <laughs> she just brought everyone to a standstill. Anyway, it's time for audience questions. Oh my goodness, and we'll have a lot. So I'm gonna take a couple at a time so that we can try to get to as many as possible. I know you had your hand up first, and I'll go to you, and then we'll try and work our way around. Yes, um, in the black uh, sweater. Up front, uh, yes, right on the aisle. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, I think I now have a new top four list of who would you like to go have dinner with, if you could. So, um, so I, my name is Morgan. I work for Algus Organics. Um, it's a black indigenous-owned uh, seaweed company. Um, we're pitching tomorrow. Um, I don't, Johannan, are you here? No. Okay. My boss, Johannan, um, is pitching tomorrow. Hey, thank you um, for doing this. Well, thank, thank you. you um, so. We've found, you know, we have data. Um, we have the ability to remove heavy metals from sargassum. We only use the seaweed that you would see washing up in the beaches on Mi in Miami here um, in the Caribbean. It's got a heavy metals issue. We found a way to uh, ferment that away with a patented process. Um, we've got data to show that farmers can apply this to their crops. They can reduce their nitrogen use um, alone by 20%. They can increase their yields, they can increase their profitability, but we're being restricted because of some of the regulation that is written into their crop insurance. They are unable to reduce their fertilizer use. What is being done to work with regulators to fast track some of these innovations to get around some of that tape? Gosh, um, does someone I'll, want I'll, to I'll just in? say really yep. quickly for us, just really quickly, we work directly with USDA, EPA. Um, we have an entire public impact team. Um, used to, you know, be a fellow at the USDA, and she's very, very well connected to just be able to to work with the regulators. We want our technologies to help the world, so part of that is making sure that they are abiding by the world's regulatory bodies. Uh, Jennifer herself has actually talked with the European Parliament um, because Europe is actually thinking about maybe changing some of the regulations um, towards CRISPR and, and gene edited crops. And so, you know, fingers crossed in the next couple of years, maybe especially for sustainability goals, I think that the world's probably going to come to the side of favorable regulatory. Yeah, and we've been traveling globally to, to, to impress upon folks the importance of having science-driven regulatory processes. For example, an example of CRISPR-Cas9, we don't, we don't regulate the process. We regulate the, pro the resulting product. Is it a plant pest? You know, and so we, we're talking about that. And what we need to do is hear from groups that are having challenges and barriers so that we can continue to try to make sure that we are turning our focus and our radar to places where sometimes it could be something small that's having a huge impact, and sometimes it could be something extremely large. But if we don't know that it exists and we need to be paying attention, it's hard for us to address it. So yeah. My, my so. suggestion is to, to go early. Yeah. talk early well and seaweed is sort of interesting right now let's let's face it because it's going to be used as a fuel supplement it's going to be used for packaging it's going to be used in um in animal feed and it's going to be used for food does that start to sound familiar 
popcorn? At scale seems to be when we start to screw things up. And right now, your biggest issue is that seaweed's really far behind in terms of this narrative, um, whether it's actually the right nutritional ratings, if it's something that, you know, we have to think about iodine, you know, when we're looking at consumption, there are lots of technologies that are coming to be able to remove the impurities. You think about it's an ocean that has a lot of inputs right now and issues, um, but but there's a lot there's a lot of promise. And so I think it's, it, it seaweed needs to be on the on the forefront it's getting there we're seeing how important it is but it is something that from a regulatory perspective we have to catch up with one of the big issues if we're going to have methane um, reduction we're going to put it into cattle feed it actually doesn't match what's the organic standard so you've got these farmers that want to be able to use asparagopsis in the feed and they can't yet because they're going to lose their organic certification so it's moving faster than a lot of things Everybody understands, like WWF is helping work on this as well. And, um, and then there's a little bit of you got to be patient, right? Because it's, it's got to work its way through the system as well. Yeah, it's, it's, some things need a lot of data. Yeah. So let me jump out. I know we only have a couple more minutes left and so many questions, but the panelists will be here and Brad has another session tomorrow. Um, so we will find a way to try to get some of the more questions answered. I see a few people in the back um, be maybe the fellow who's standing with his hand up since he stood through this panel, which a lot of people did. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Robert Cologne. I'm an adaptation planner for Miami-Dade County. You know, we have a lot of places that are going to flood, not just from sea level rise, but from groundwater rise. And it's already happening. We have repetitive loss properties being bought out, people calling for more managed retreat in the scientific community. Are you aware of any research that's looking at introducing aquaculture to these places that are currently urban development, but we know will be full of water in the next 20 years? Those systems, and, and we'll, we'll sort of, uh, I think it'd be best to speak offline about it because land-based aquaculture, there are, when you, just like any other um, land animal, when you raise the right fish in the right system with the right technology you you and the right if it's the water inputs or whatever else that system needs um, you've got one down here that's got a lot of big problems with salmon and I would stand here and say that was the wrong investment in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong species so just like anywhere else what I think is really interesting is the DARPA conversation because DARPA actually did a bid because they understand that we've clear-cut the coastal we've clear-cut our coastal um, uh, land, right? I mean, whether it's under the water or we've created these beaches. And part of the effect of climate change is that these storms now could just run their way all the way up with no sort of mitigation um, to land. So if we start to look at things like the Billion Oyster Project, where they're actually building these beautiful oyster farms in the Hudson River because oysters will filter 52% of the water that goes through them. So now you've got something you can eat and an ecosystem benefit. Um, and coral farms, as part of the DARPA bid, was to look at a group called Coral Vita that is actually here, and they actually started to look at could we rebuild coral farms with climate change resilient coral the way they the way they do this, look into what they do, and then in addition you've got you've got an ecosystem now that's rebounding with more fish, more seaweed, more kelp, which then mitigates these issues that you're having on land. So these are uh, in the series we're going to talk about um, the fish pond system of Hawaii and how if those four fish ponds would have still been in front of Lahaina and the wetlands wouldn't have been destroyed, they wouldn't have had those fire issues. So these are all things that we can rebuild wow. now as long as we value how we're using our coastlines and, and, and obviously um, how we're using that groundwater. Thinking about nature and using nature to our benefit instead of fighting it. Um, is there one more? I'll take... One in the very back, there's someone with a cap on who's very, yes, standing up. And I know we don't have much time, so I'm indulging. Thank you, audience, Thank you. for staying. My name is Lynette Sowell. I am one of the local farmers here in Miami that's quickly dwindling. Um, my farm, what we do is we recycle food into organic fertilizers and soil. Um, we do not have enough money to pay me a salary. I'm a single mom. I get a call from a developer about once a month asking me to buy my property for four times what I paid for it. Miami-Dade County um, actually returned a grant from the USDA that would have expanded composting efforts in Miami because they said we were an illegal operation, but yet has never explained to me why they think we're illegal. 
what resources are out there for people like me to stay in ag instead of doing the easy thing and selling out? So, yeah. yeah. Right, so the first thing we need to do is, uh, I want, as soon as this is over, I want you to talk, Carlton, stand up. So I want you to touch base with Carlton. And uh, we need to get you in contact with the right people at USDA to ask the right questions. Um, that, because you can go straight to the source <laughs> to ask the questions, and so we can figure out what's going on, you know? And if there are some things that are policy-related things that we, once again, need to be on our radar, because if the program is not having the impact which is our intent, we need to know if there's some barriers there. And so we want to be able to address that and connect you with the right people. I just want to say real quickly that forestry, the U.S. Forest Service is a part of USDA. We haven't talked much about trees and the value that trees will have in helping us meet these uh, global, these global um, goals that we have around climate change. So I just wanted to just put that Thank in there Thank you real for quickly. throwing that in, Shavonda. And I just want to say, Thank you for that last question because it really does hit right at the heart of this. We have a lot of things that we need to overcome, but we also have a lot of potential. And I think what makes me excited about this, and I hope all of you, is that this is the next wave of climate innovation and climate uh, solutions that are out there. There's so much potential. And I just want to ask you to help me thank Shavanda and Brad and Jen for all the work they do, for your service, and uh, for all your innovations. And thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference.